Hello there, heroes! I'm the Orange Hyperforce Ranger, and welcome to another Power Rangers Hyperforce session review. First things off, I did find out that the folks at Hyper RPG are titling the sessions as they upload them to YouTube. The first session was titled Welcome to Time Force Academy. However, since I do these reviews right after the Twitch sessions instead of waiting for the YouTube videos, I have no way of knowing what those titles are until they come out the next week, and like I said, I'm not waiting that long. So, oh well, I'm just going to keep giving these sessions my own titles, and hey, maybe every now and then I'll line up and get it right. Secondly, I do realize that this review is running a little bit late. The thing is, Hyperforce using the time stream has kind of destabilized the time matrix and Vesper is a little too busy to fix it, so things are a little bit wonky at the moment. I am looking into it and everything should be settled in time for the third session. Alrighty, set up aside, it is time to take a look at the second session of Power Rangers Hyperforce. They came to Angel Grove! The story seems to take a slight step back in time right at the start as we once again see the rangers getting used to their new ship, finding their rooms, the kitchen, etc. Oh man, Hyperforce is starting to repeat scenes around breaks, it's just like Ninja Steel! Anyway, Chloe is the one that finds the food machine, which is basically a Star Trek replicator, and orders up a round of burritos for everyone. As the others start fiddling with the controls and Vesper finds a large conspicuous red button, Chloe accidentally drops a burrito onto it. This opens a section of the wall that reveals new weapons. The Hyperforce Blade Blasters. Yes, just like the ones in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, except on these ones the blade is holographic, but it still hits and does damage. Alpha decides that it's time for a team building exercise and has everybody introduce themselves. After that little bit of fun, they ask how long it's going to be until they get to Angel Grove 1994. Alpha informs them that they haven't left yet. The ship has basically been sitting idle on the launch pad. Vesper finds the main controls and Alpha informs them that they no longer need the Transwarp Megazord, which you might remember is giant yellow Mc smacky butt, <laughs> to launch into the time stream. Now they can use the power of the Hyperforce to launch the ship into time. As they get underway, Alpha stands in for Zordon here and gives the Rangers the famous three rules speech, though with the added modifier that since these are Time Force Rangers, they are also forbidden from changing time. Alpha fine-tunes the scan and says the Dark Villain has arrived in Angel Grove, California on October 31st, 1994. It's Halloween, as it was when this session actually aired. The Rangers give chase. These Rangers are completely unfamiliar with the concept of Halloween. It's a little depressing to think that Halloween didn't make it into the 3000s. Even Eddie, the team's historian, is a little shaky on the concept. He calls Halloween a pagan festival where people would walk around wearing the skin and clothing of others. Fortunately for the Rangers, Alpha has a hologram generator that's able to give the Rangers regular 1994 clothing. As Alpha does this, the android kind of operates the controls secretly, turning away from Vesper especially, and Vesper realizes that Alpha doesn't want her to know what the ship is capable of. She basically throws a temper tantrum about this and just starts mashing buttons. Suddenly, the entire team is teleported down to Angel Grove on Halloween night. They see trick-or-treating children making their rounds, but they struggle to fit in with this custom. Chloe joins a little girl that's trick-or-treating, but realizes she doesn't have a container to hold the candy, so she grabs one of the house's jack-o'-lanterns. Vesper walks up and simply says that she's a cop, before Marv steps in and charismatically tells the woman that they're just getting candy for some of their shy younger siblings. The rangers duck into a dark alley so Eddie can call Alpha. However, they realize that this dark alley leads them straight to a Halloween superstore, perhaps the same one where Abracadanger got his new staff. They realize the store is getting absolutely overrun in a last minute rush. Alpha tells the Rangers that he will not create money for them since doing so could upset the local economy and change history. To be fair, I don't think that giving each of these Rangers, say, $100 each would change things all that much, even in 1994, but I do understand the general concept. 
The Rangers each find a costume that just so happens to match the costumes the actors actually wore to the session. Imagine that. And Malika takes a moment to specifically point out to them that the store is chaos. People running around everywhere, and the clerk is sitting at the counter, slumped over, oblivious to the entire world. Credit to the players, then, for not taking the bait, playing the Rangers as do-gooder heroes that insist on finding a way to pay for their costumes. So I didn't mention this before because I found the joke a little bit lame, but it did end up playing into things. The Rangers were learning about 1994 on the time ship and replicated cardboard circles with pictures on them that Eddie thought were called togs. They're actually pogs, of course. And they confuse these for currency. However, they obviously aren't and the clerk can't accept them as payment. Marv searches on the ground for some money and happens to find 20 bucks, but that's not enough for all of their costumes. The clerk feels sorry for them and says if they'll fold some of those costumes over there, he'll look the other way and they can take their costumes. Marv searches the costumes for more money and uses a super in order to do so. It proves worthwhile as he finds another 20 bucks. As the Rangers fold costumes, and trust me, part of my regular job is folding shirts, and that's annoying enough, folding costumes has got to be a nightmare. The Rangers have Alpha scan for the time ship. Nothing comes up, so Marv tells Alpha to look for any large open areas where a time ship could be hiding cloaked. Unfortunately, Angel Grove is a rather large city in California, so there are quite a few. Parks, parking lots, mountains, etc. Jack gets a hunch that they should be looking for a park. A big green open park. Maybe one that's sitting right by a lake. Finishing up at the store, the rangers leave with their costumes and nearby see a party going down at what seems to be a pretty hip happening place. The Angel Grove Youth Center Gym and Juice Bar. Jack takes a moment to scold Chloe on her thieving ways at the academy and tells her to keep her hands to herself. She is saddened by the sudden rebuke, but Marv makes her feel better by giving her the 20 bucks. As they approach, Vesper realizes that she's feeling really good and does a gigantic flip into the middle of the street. Marv and Eddie realize this too and race each other to the juice bar. Inside, they see people doing gymnastics and karate as well as people over at the juice bar. Vesper is still feeling incredibly energetic and agile, so she climbs up on the balance beam and nails three perfect backflips. This draws a bit of attention, and the rangers take the opportunity to ask the crowd where the park is, claiming to be from Stone Canyon and not knowing Angel Grove that well. Someone who may have been Rocky from Malika's description walks up and says, Hey, I'm also from Stone Canyon. What part? So Marv very quickly changes course and says, oh, he's actually from Summer Cove. I mean, I get it. These two word California cities are so alike, especially when their initials are both SC. They get directions to the park, those directions being, um, it's across the street, down maybe a block. Maybe Rocky seems to be interested in Vesper, but Marv seems to get jealous, pulling her aside and saying that she's taken. Meanwhile, Eddie has found his way to the juice bar, and Ernie has introduced him to the deliciousness of a pineapple smoothie. Vesper, however, slaps it from his hands, saying it's not healthy, and starting to explain to Ernie that they're from the year 3016, and... <laughs> Jack gets fed up with these rambunctious kids and decides to walk outside, but stops at a TV with a crowd around it. It's a news report showing a time ship hovering in the nearby park, with the reporter asking, where are the Power Rangers? He calls the team outside and calls Marv Marvelous Marv, a nickname that Marv seems to hate. However, Vesper wants a nickname, seeing it as a sign of friendship. They decide to call her V. A crowd has gathered at the time ship, and the rangers realize they can't investigate until the civilians are out of the way. So they loudly announce a costume contest at the juice bar. You can win smoothies, togs, even $20 bills. The crowd, for the most part, disperses, and the rangers call Alpha, but Alpha can't really tell them much. The rangers then see somebody in a ghost costume getting chased by six humanoid but malformed figures that look as if they were made from clay. 
Yep, it's the putties. Eddie remembers them from history and explains to the others what they are. Marv gets down to the deepest base conclusion here. Somebody's in trouble, right? And leaps into action. It's time for the Rangers' first full team battle, which means it's also time to explain Popcorn Initiative. In a standard D&D &D system, players will roll for initiative, a phrase I'm sure even those of you that haven't played RPGs have heard before, which determines the order in which they will act. However, if you think about it, that's kind of a formal system for Power Rangers, where the fights are just kind of situations where people pop up where they're needed and just do whatever they're going to do at the time. So instead, this game is using Popcorn Initiative. Basically, the last player to act gets the first turn. Once they're done with their turn, they can toss the action to any other player or to Malika, the Game Master. So yes, all five Rangers can act and take a turn before Malika gets to control the bad guys. But if the team does that, Malika gets the last turn of that round and the first turn of the next round, so it's a calculated risk. The battle actually started out very well. Marv tackled the group and took out one putty, and then Vesper kicked into them and took out another and was so intimidating about it that she scared a third away. However, this is when the dice got cursed for a little bit. Chloe gets a boost from Vesper to jump up and kick some more, and the two of them both rolled ones. Christina tried to use a super to boost Vesper's attack to a three, but there were two problems with this. One, this was a team attack, so both of their roles had to succeed in order for the attack to work. And two, as Malika had to eventually stress to everyone playing, you have to use your power-ups before you roll, not after you roll. Seeing which way the wind was blowing, Megan tossed the action over to Malika to get her one turn out of the way. The retreating putty saw that the rangers weren't doing that well and turned around to attack Chloe, grabbing her around the legs. Chloe rolled a one for defense and Malika rolled a bolt six. The putty glomps around her legs and she loses a turn. Malika tosses the action to Andre, so Eddie grabs some candy corn from Chloe that they'd gotten at the house earlier and throws it at the putties like ninja stars. He rolls a one, but supers it up to a three. Malika allows this, but explains again the rule about power-ups. So basically, the putty holding Chloe grabs one of the pieces of candy corn and eats it, gets distracted by how good it is, and lets her go. Jack sweeps at the putties, but Paul rolls a one, so they're able to see it, and they jump back. The action gets tossed over to Malika, and she attacks with the putties once. Eddie and V start discussing their next move, but then Malika has to rule up here. You see, her attacking group has three putties in it, which means that she gets three turns every go. It was just interesting after I kind of mentioned last week that she was a little soft and easy on the team, a lot of newcomers to RPGs and stuff. This week she got a little bit tougher, played more by the rules, and it was good to see. Straighten up and fly right, Rangers. The two putties that Jack attacked attack him back. He uses a zero-g football ram rush to get them. He misses one, but he hits the other. Vesper jumps off Eddie to do a neck strike, and she falls down and misses. Marv gets fed up with all of this and calls Alpha to have the robot send down his blade blaster and he just blasts the putty that's holding the civilian. Jack has Chloe run towards him, grabs her cat costume and flings her at the putties. Unfortunately, he actually flings her far over the putties. She tries to kick off a tree and attack from the other side and she falls short. The rolls were just killing the team this round. Uh, once again, Megan tosses things back to Malika and she has the three putties run at the Rangers. So let's take a bathroom break. After the break, Chloe tries to defend herself from the putties attack and rolls another one. Eddie uses his serpent strike and finally remembers to use super in the right spot before the roll and the dice reward him with a bolt six, giving him an eight. He takes out two putties. Back to Malika, some of the remaining putties, to be honest, I thought there was one, but now it seems like there's two, so I'm kind of not sure how many there actually were. Anyway, some of the putties try to copy Jack and Chloe's launch move. 
Unfortunately, they also end up copying the bad rolling, so it fails. Peter picks up on the lesson that Andre taught him, that using your super before your roll when you're supposed to leads to great results, and does so, and also gets rewarded with a bolt six, making it another eight. Malika rolls for her defense, and then realizes that her D6 does not have an 8 on it, so there was no point to that. One of the putties gets blasted into the other, both are destroyed, and the Rangers finally win. But the Rangers have a little bit more left on their plate, or should I say, in their candy stash. The time ship opens, and out walks a giant humanoid triangle, striped orange, brown, and white. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's a monster, and it's a giant candy corn monster. His name is Candicus Cornicus. So I guess he's a Roman candy corn monster. The rangers look around, make sure that the coast is clear, and then they do this. Before I go on, I wanted to take a quick second to talk about actually using that clip in this video. I'm using that clip because I've seen it in a couple of other places on YouTube already. Those videos have been monetized and it doesn't seem like Hyper RPG has any kind of a problem with that. However, I am filming this review after the third session has aired, and during that session they did take a moment to talk about how they've already seen some of the Power Rangers Hyperforce content being pirated, uploaded to YouTube before they do, and how they really just prefer people not do that, and that's something I definitely agree with. Hyper RPG is a very small company, and this is a very cool thing that they're doing as part of our fandom, bringing the Power Rangers fandom in. And pirating that content is a really crappy thing to do, to be honest, to this small company that's doing such great things for us. And I mean, supporting the show officially doesn't cost you any money. I'm not spending a dime on Power Rangers Hyperforce. All you have to do is watch the stream on Twitch on the Hyper RPG channel when it airs, or if you can't make that, just be a little patient, wait one week, and they upload it themselves to YouTube for free. You don't have to spend any money. You can spend money. You can support them. There's buying the Ultra Supers and Megas. There's subscribing to their channel. There's other little boosts and things, donating bits, things that you can do in the metagame, etc. You can, you know, talk about all that kind of stuff and supporting it financially, but you don't have to support it financially is what I'm trying to get to. You can just support it by just being a good person, being a good ranger, if you will. Uh, it was really unfortunate to hear them say that uh, content is being pirated already. I mean, I guess it's not surprising, but um, it still was kind of sad. In this particular case, this is the morphing sequence. This is something they're going to use in a lot of episodes. It's not unique. It's going to be the same thing every single time. And like I said, I've already seen it up on YouTube and they don't seem to have a problem with that. So that's why I'm using that in this video and monetizing this video. But I just wanted to make sure to say that when I'm doing that, that you should still completely support the official product. Back to the review. Now that I've taken a lot of seconds to talk about that, I will take a few seconds to talk about how incredible this morphing sequence is. It looks absolutely fantastic. The only downside to it is that the rangers don't fully form into their suits, and seeing as they don't have the suits, since the suits aren't a real thing, at least not yet, that is something that's easily forgiven. The morph dance is really easy. In fact, even I've picked it up already. Hyperforce, orange, ready. Power up! Marv starts the battle off with a super lion bite attack, which hits and knocks the monster back. It responds by throwing candy corn at them, which does some minor damage to Marv. Chloe does a super whirlwind attack, but the monster spins to avoid her. Vesper uses a Cerberus Maul, but the monster avoids that as well. Jack draws his blade blaster and throws it at the monster, 
but he misses as well. Remember what I was saying about bad rolls? Eddie uses a super Cobra HP attack and misses. Marv decides the best way to snap his team out of this funk is to use an ultra lion bite. He rolls an 11 and Malika gives him a side-eyed glance. He's thinking, oh no, she rolled a 12. But in fact, she rolled a 10 and the attack hits for a bunch of damage. The monster, his name's a mouthful, all right? A mouthful of candy corn lets out a heat belch, which melts some of the candy corn that's stuck to the ranger suits, and it hits Marv for 12 damage. Jack tries his big horn attack, but the monster not only manages to catch and avoid it, but fires a heat belch at him that hits for 8 damage. Chloe tries to get a little smart about this. She fires up a mega hurricane whirlwind, but also grabs some of the candy corn. She figures if the monster fires another heat belch, she can throw the candy corn back at the monster and hits for some damage. One tiny little miscalculation. Mega increases damage, not the attack roll. Unfortunately, she fails the attack roll, but she does manage to avoid damage herself. Vesper yells, I'm from 3016, and uses an ultra hound of Hades attack. She targets Canicus Cornicus's, see, I can say it, and making it possessive makes it even trickier, small white tip and hits for 15 damage. Eddie all of a sudden flashes back to talking about how healthy Ernie's smoothies actually are, and this gives him an idea. He decides to run back to the juice bar. Malika decides to allow this, but his movement there has to be his turn. He's got to come back on his next turn. He asks Ernie for a barrel-sized pineapple smoothie. Ernie finds this a bit of an odd request, but of course he's always eager to help the Power Rangers. Back at the battle, Vesper uses a super Cerberus Maul with Marv helping by holding the monster in place. Marv does a super lion maul himself, but the monster belches and burns more of that candy corn stuck to Marv's suit, hitting for 10 damage. Marv then gets really heroic, deciding to stick his body to the melty monster so it's not able to attack anyone else. It does manage to throw more candy corn, but misses. Chloe uses a super ultra eye of the phoenix attack striking the monster in the eye she gets some of the monster's goop on her hands and opens her mouthpiece to taste it having a sweet tooth chloe actually likes it jack tries a ram rage berserker attack basically spinning like a giant yellow taz however when he gets close he sees that marv is stuck to the monster and so he backs off Eddie runs back with a giant smoothie and uses a super mega python ambush to toss it at the monster. But this is where a strange sequence of events takes place. As the monster gets covered in the liquid, the time ship hatch opens and a beam lances out from it and hits the monster. The monster is vaporized, but we're never really able to tell if it was the beam, the smoothie, or some combination of the two. The dark figure of the Alliance leader walks down the ramp, and then the time ship actually seems to leave. Jack tells everyone to pull their blade blasters and to attack the monster all together, super, super blaster style. This actually catches Malika off guard. She wasn't expecting that, and she had to kind of GM on the fly. She has the entire team roll, but nothing is added together. This is basically the entire team attacking all at once, individually if that makes any sense anyway they hit for 30 damage but on this guy that's hardly even a scratch the alliance leader reveals that he knows exactly who these people are a group of time force cadets and one time force beat cop he says that his goal is to build his army across all of time and to clear his legacy Vesper wants to arrest the Alliance leader, but Jack is the only one of the five that has the badge that can do so. So Marv just rushes in to attack. Eddie actually has to use an attack, his Python ambush, to stop his friend from doing something incredibly stupid. Fortunately, it works. The leader calls Jack the only one here that's worthy of him since he's an actual Time Force officer but that doesn't concern him, seeing as he's destroyed the other Time Force Rangers. Jack activates his badge for an arrest, 
but the leader blasts him for 30 damage. The rangers decide it's time to retreat, helping Jack as they go. Alpha starts to teleport them back to the ship, but the leader gets one more shot in, hitting Jack for 24 damage. They arrive back on the ship, but obviously Jack is down. They rush him to the med bay, and Alpha says that he's in critical condition. This moment is when the ship gets attacked and shakes wildly. Jack actually falls off the bed, but Marv dives to cushion the blow. As more attacks rock the ship, the lights go out, the power goes down, and the rangers hear Jack flatline as the session ends. This was a fantastic session. I think they did a really good job channeling the era of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers in 1994, what the people were like, and the kind of situations that would happen especially. Eddie running back to the battle pushing a big barrel side smoothie is a scene that feels like it was taken directly from Ju 2 footage. But then we get real drama and excitement. The rangers have a battle with the main boss, and he hands their butts to them. And yeah, Jack is basically on the brink of death. This session of Hyperforce, we got a great morphing sequence, walking around in the 1990s, some serious drama, and near death. Meanwhile on Ninja Steel, they're playing tennis and messing around with magic near the end of their season. One of these is a much better Power Rangers TV show than the other, and it's kind of sad that it's the one that's not actually a Power Rangers TV show. They Came to Angel Grove gets a 5 out of 5. That's going to do it for another Power Rangers Hyperforce session review. Thank you folks so much, as always, for watching. Make sure to like the video by clicking the like button right down below. In the comments below, let me know what you thought of this session. And again, since this video is a little bit late, this video is covering the second session. So let me know what you thought of that session. I'm going to be doing a video on the third session just a little bit later, kind of playing catch-ups here. And as always, Thumpers, I'm super excited to hear from you guys down in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel to see all of my videos, including these latest Power Rangers Hyperforce session reviews, especially set up your notifications to make sure that that happens. And if you do feel like supporting my channel financially in any way, that's something I would greatly appreciate. You can go to digitaltipjar.com slash orangerangervid and just toss me any little financial tips that you would like. It's something that would really mean a lot to me. Until next time, heroes, may the power protect you and go, go Hyperforce. As the ship gets underway, Alpha gives the rangers the famous three blah, 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 there it is, wearing the skins and clothing of others. Perhaps the same superstore where Abracadanger got his new staff. I yeah. This draws some attention, and the rangers take the opportunity to ask the crowd where the park is. Uh, crud. And starting to explain to Ernie that she's there from the, 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 the They get directions to the park, those directions being um across the street, down maybe a block. Maybe Ernie seems maybe Ernie. The two putties that uh, Unfortunately, he actually fling, flings and it's been monetized and there don't seem to be any problems. So it would seem to me that hyper arch RP and they did take a moment to specifically mention that they have seen their content. A Power Rangers Hyper RP Hyper. Chloe tries a super whirlwind kick, but she misses. Eddie uses a super cobra strike. Fart. He then does a super lion maul. Marv does a super lion maul himself. What? The monster burps again. And thumpers, as always, I'm always really excited to hear from you guys. Give me a shout out. Give me a shout out for your thumpers down in the comments below. And I'm going to do that again.